accounts of the practice, which you may find upsetting. Our world. Kurdistan, the safest and most prosperous region of Iraq. But for years, the country harbored a secret. Many of its women had been caught in the name of religion. Few in the outside world knew that female genital mutilation existed here. Until a charity launched a campaign with the help of local filmmakers to tell women's stories. I picked up a big rock and threw it at the midwife's head. <laughs> I'm Shaima Khalil, and I'm here to find out the inside story of the fight against FGM. Using never-before-seen footage, I'll hear women talking frankly about the impact of FGM on their lives. And I'll ask if enough is being done to end the practice in Kurdistan altogether. Southern Iraqi Kurdistan, a remote and mountainous region with a sleepy pace of life. But there have been dramatic changes here. This is Tutakal, one of a handful of villages in Iraqi Kurdistan to have banned female genital mutilation. Traditionally, autumn was the time when girls, usually under five, would have been circumcised by the village midwife. Now, the season means nothing more than the start of a school term. Two years ago, Tutkal publicly agreed to stop cutting its women and girls. It's one of seven FGM-free villages in Kurdistan, and it's received improved public services thanks to a local charity, Wadi, as an incentive to uphold the ban. The mayor tells me he thinks the government only started paying attention to Tutakal, providing the village with a new school and electricity in the past few months alone, because of the media interest generated by banning FGM. We believe that your body is yours and that cutting part of it is an act of violence. We're very proud to be the first to start this campaign. The mayor and his wife seem to have a genuine commitment to the cause. They stopped their youngest daughter, Dunya, from being cut years ago. Her big sister was cut in secret by her grandmother while her parents were out of the house. They knew I would not want to cut my girl, so they cut her when I was out, and it couldn't be undone. She is unhappy about it. She always tells me, why could you stop them cutting Dunya, but not me? I always wanted both of them not to be cut. Most of the cutting in villages like this one was done by a midwife who'd often use unsterilized razor blades or knives on several girls. We're three hours drive away from any major hospital, so these girls wouldn't have had access to any medical help if they needed it. No disinfectants, no anesthetics, just a razor blade and some ash to seal the wound. The ban has come too late for most here. Almost every woman and girl I spoke to had already had what they call khatana. And after some giggling, Dunya's friends are keen to tell me about a subject that was totally taboo when they were growing up. Who here has been cut by show of hands? <laughs> so everyone here except you, <laughs> Dunya. I'm unhappy that I have been cut, but my sister hasn't. I feel very sad about it, very sad that she has been cut because she would have felt pain, like all the others. I wish she wasn't cut. I wish she was like me. 
Do any of you remember being cut? I was very little and I was playing with a friend of mine when my mum grabbed me and said the man who sells fruits and vegetables and sweets is here in the village, so we're going to buy you something. We were taken to a house and that's when I had Hatana. <laughs> so you didn't know that you were going to be cut? No, if I had known I would not have gone. Can you tell me a little bit more about what it was like being taken into that room? I remember it was very painful. Two women held me down. I know our bodies belong to us, so why did they take something that was mine? Why did they cut a piece of me that was mine? Kurdistan has been autonomous from Baghdad since 1991. It's more recently enjoyed an oil boom that's brought security and foreign investment unknown in the rest of the country. And when FGM was uncovered here, it sent shockwaves through society. To many, it was unthinkable this ancient tradition could still be going on. It was discovered by chance. In 2004, following the fall of Saddam Hussein, Kurdistan was braced for refugees from the rest of Iraq. And a local charity, Wadi, sent teams into the villages to provide support. The refugees never arrived, but Wadi's staff started coming back with stories of young girls being cut. One of our team members in Gamian region uh, uh, informed us that people, they ask them about female genital mutilation and if they cut, how they can cut and these kind of things. And we were quite surprised. We knew that it's existing, but we didn't know that it's con this practice is continuing. And they reported that 60% of uh, the females they interviewed are mutilated or they suffer from mutilation. Falah took his findings to the authorities, who were shocked by the idea that FGM could still be happening in Kurdistan. When the reports came out, the Kurdistan regional government denied it. Then it became kind of challenge between us, and one need to prove that it's existing or not existing. In an effort to persuade the government that the practice was still happening, he asked local filmmakers to start documenting women's stories. The stories they came back with were like nothing heard before. It is forbidden to discuss Hatana in the villages, so it is safe for us to talk here with you. The story which made me, this man which fight FGM, and I became a spokesperson of this campaign for nine years, was a story of one girl I think that time she was about six years old. They said, let's go to another village, to the house of your aunt. They said, don't wear trousers, do not put on your underwear, your blouse is enough. Two women took me away and they said, we will style your hair. And suddenly, both women held my legs. One said, hold her leg, come and cut her. I picked up a knife. I said to them, leave me alone or I will stab you. They said, we will cut you. I still had the knife in my hand and said, let me go. They let me go and I ran away. And she's telling her story bravely to camera, how she was fighting the midwife and her mother when they wanted to cut her. And no one was there to help her. So after I saw this story and really in, uh, influenced me a lot and I said from now we will defend these small young girls. I picked up a big rock and threw it at the midwife's head. For mask was never cut and Wadi launched a campaign to end FGM. They worked with a local filmmaker, Nabaz Ahmed, traveling from village to village filming women's stories and gathering data about the level of FGM. 
the filmmakers gained rare access to khatana being practiced and filmed these upsetting images of young girls being cut. Women told them FGM, or khatana, involved cutting a young girl's clitoris. Most said they felt religiously obliged to cut their daughters to keep them pure, although FGM isn't mentioned in the Quran. I have asked our mullah, and he said it is pure to perform khatana, so we have to follow his words. In some regions, Wadi found every single woman over 60 had been cut. While for teenagers across the country, it was almost half. On average, they found the level of khatana was higher than they first thought, and that just under three quarters of women over the age of 14 had been cut. In the very beginning, we were surprised uh, because especially for me and for, let's say, my other colleagues, men, this, is, this was hidden. For me, I didn't know. After I checked, then step by step, all my family members, they started to speak out. And then we find out it's very spread in our family and in many other families. And then I find out that everyone is too shy because the, it's, uh, it's related to sex issues and uh, the genital of women. So here, no one is ready to talk about it. A female filmmaker joined the team to help break the taboo and find women willing to talk. <laughs> Hatana is a sensitive and frightening term. The hardest thing was finding women willing to talk on camera. As a woman, I understood their suffering and tried to put myself in their position to feel their pain. I wanted to raise awareness so the next generation of women doesn't have to go through this. She found the few girls who had not been cut were stigmatized and tended to lie about it to their peers. One of the girls was called Nisa. She would have been in year six or seven. She was one of the few who had not been cut. But with friends and relatives, she said the opposite, to avoid humiliation. Do you want to be cut? No, but because I am not cut, they will tease me and say my clitoris will become larger and that I will feel sensations and go after boys. Because you're not cut, what else do they say to you? They tease me and say, your clitoris is not cut off. Why do they say those things to you? I don't know. Does the teasing make you want to get cut? No, because now I just tell them that I am cut. In 2010, the debate around FGM changed dramatically. Human Rights Watch published a report into the practice in Kurdistan. It described in painful detail the impact of the cutting on young girls' lives. International pressure began to mount for the practice to be banned, and it emerged that this was not simply a religious obligation. Nobody in the outside world really knew about it. I mean, that was really the real shocker. Female genital mutilation, people give it many justifications, that it's a tradition, part of their cultural identity. Some people do it as in Kurdistan, justified within their own religion. Um, some people do it as in Kurdistan, out of social pressure. Uh, my inclination after speaking to, you know, religious leaders in, in Iraqi Kurdistan, that it really is to control women's sexuality. And in fact, two of the mullahs in, in, in the villages did say to me, in hot climates in Iraqi Kurdistan, something needs to be done to control women's sexuality. The filmmakers found that FGM wasn't just practiced in villages. In Kirkuk, one of the major cities in northern Iraq, they found a couple willing to talk about the impact of FGM on their marriage. Their interview has never been shown outside Iraq. I don't have desire. I have no desire for a man. I knew from an early age I was like that. Of course, when you're a kid, you don't understand that. 
But when you grow older, you know the difference. When you were cut, did they remove a little or a lot? My husband says nothing is left of you. So I don't know, but that's what he says. This circumcision is similar to neutering animals. It's a major problem. There's no sensation. And it feels like lying next to a cold fish. With all due respect, I often ask her to come to me, but because she doesn't get any pleasure out of it, I have to call her five or six times. But if she enjoyed it, she'd get involved faster. For eight years after I got married, I didn't know there was such a thing as sexual pleasure. I was a young girl. I was 18 when I got engaged and 19 when I got married. Even when I had two kids, I still didn't understand. I thought that marriage is having your own house, coming and going as you wish, and having a family. I didn't know what that thing was. I wasn't aware of this when I married her. If I had known, I swear to God, even if they'd paid me $10,000, I wouldn't have married her, because it's a problem for me. But I'm trying to tolerate the situation. As the public debate about FGM intensified, the filmmakers found women talking openly for the first time about whether or not they should cut their daughters. And that this ambivalence meant some girls had been cut without their mothers even knowing. I was away one afternoon and my mother-in-law took my daughters to the neighbors. A woman had come to the neighborhood to cut children. When I came back, she was cut. I have not had Katana done to my younger daughter yet. Some say you have to do it, others say not to do it. Her aunts are not happy. They say she must have Katana. She will not be pure if she doesn't. I can't decide what to do. Just months after filming Golala, the law was changed and FGM outlawed as part of a wide-ranging law to improve women's rights. The family violence law is all-encompassing. It includes issues like honor killing, domestic violence, child labor, and FGM. A mother charged with cutting her daughter, for instance, could face up to three years in prison and a fine. Gasha Darahafid was head of the Women's Rights Committee when the law was passed and helped push the ban through Parliament. This was difficult for members of Parliament and even society to accept. We were often told by ordinary people, don't you have anything better to work on than FGM? We knew we might face difficulties mentioning FGM due to the cultural sensitivity, so we decided that we should put FGM within a wider proposal for a law against domestic violence. The law was a huge milestone, but the campaign to end FGM is not over. When the law changed in 2011, some warned that banning the practice would simply drive it underground. I want to know how effective the new law has been, so I'm on my way to a village in Rania, one of the most conservative areas of Kurdistan. Wadi have printed thousands of copies of the law and are traveling to the villages telling women that Khatana is now illegal. Wadi have been to this village twice before. And you get the sense women here are keen to say the right thing when asked awkward questions, which makes it hard to tell what's really going on. Because this issue has been discussed in the media so much here, some people are quick to tell you what you want to hear. 
I asked a mother whether any of her three girls were cut, and she was quick to tell me, no, no, of course not. It's not a good practice. But after our conversation, one of her girls pulled me aside and said, yes, she is. She didn't want to say this on camera, though. <laughs> But eventually, we meet women who are happy to talk more candidly. Bessie is one of the older women in the village, still living off the land. She told me she values the old ways of life. Bessie Khan, you have a granddaughter. Do you think that she should be cut? In my opinion, it needs to be done, as it's God's will. In my opinion, she should get cut because God likes it, nothing else. Besekhan, were you aware of the law that was passed by the government to ban FGM? I'm illiterate. I heard on TV it had been banned. Before, people used to do it and it was normal. Now people don't talk about it because TV said it shouldn't be done. Although Bessie has heard that the law has changed, it appears this ancient tradition is still deeply rooted in some villages. And to date, no one has been convicted for performing FGM. I want to know if the politicians who masterminded the ban think the law is working. Why is it that after two years, only one case has gone to court when you know just as well as I do that this practice still goes on. It's true that two years have passed, but this law is trying to change a culture that existed for a long time, and as a result, the law hasn't penetrated people's minds yet. In the next term, we need to work more to understand the problems with this law and why it isn't being implemented. Is it a problem with the law itself or the way it's policed? We have to make sure that this law will prevent FGM. The Kurdish government has now promised a comprehensive survey of the levels of FGM today, which should be delivering results in the next few years. But the human cost of this practice is much harder to quantify. Earlier this year, the filmmakers went back to meet Nisar, one of the few girls they met who had not been cut. They don't call me names now. Only my aunt calls me names when my mother isn't here. What does she say to you? <laughs> she calls me the uncut vagina which makes me angry, and I stop talking to her. Would you like to be cut? No. Of course not. Why not? I don't like it. I'm older now and it's wrong. Do you regret cutting your other daughters? Yes. Why do you feel sorry? Because they have no desire anymore. That was why we did it so early to avoid trouble for them. After almost 10 years of working and campaigning against FGM, do you believe that things are getting better now? First of all, the taboo is broken. It's not taboo anymore. Because the problem was, FGM was is existing in our families and we didn't know about it. Now we look with open eyes at the reality about FGM. And now the government is uh, obliged, they are obliged to uh, implement this law. Back in Tutkal, lifting the taboo has led to difficult conversations. Dunya's mother wanted me to speak to the older women of the village before I left. Hello. Of course I regret it. Who would want to harm their own children? But in those days we were told otherwise. We were told it was a religious obligation, that their husbands would send them back in the morning if they weren't cut. Talat cut all five of her daughters, including Diman who remembers being told she was going to buy sweets. 
There's no need to be angry with my mother. It was a widespread practice and we love her. We should be angry with those who spread this practice in the name of religion. According to Wadi, FGM is now falling in Kurdistan. But from what I've seen, the country is still scarred by this ancient tradition. From grandmothers who feel wronged by the change in the law, to girls angry at being mutilated. And the mothers, who only ever did what they thought was right, and can't undo the damage done in the name of tradition.